Hello everyone. Um, we're going to finish off our uh, topic on international business tonight um, with uh, Warhain, the latter half of Warhain, and into Arnold. And actually, there's no one in the chat, and I think part of that's my fault. Um, if you're watching this later, uh, and you're someone who usually has been coming to these, um, I was uh, distracted and busy. I was actually talking to someone on the phone. And I forgot to get the link up like a half hour, hour out from the lecture like I usually do. Uh, so I posted the link right before I, uh, <laughs> before 8 o'clock here for um, recording the lecture. So there's no one here yet. Might also be end of the quarter. I totally understand if you're busy. Um, but uh, so I'll just talk to myself and try to pretend like there are people here. Um, <laughs> and it'll be okay. Um, but that's the plan for tonight. The plan will be to... Finish off Warhain and do Arnold, and we'll see how it goes. And my apologies in advance. It has been a very long day, and I'm already feeling the kind of energy sap from me. Now, usually, get a little philosophy in my system, and I'll perk right up. But uh, I've got some juice here. Maybe some sugar is going to help me. Um, but my apologies if I am a little flagged tonight. But there is a lot to talk about, so I probably do need to get the energy up. So, um, to pick up where we left off last time, um, in the last lecture, I did talk about Warhain a little bit toward the end of the video, and I focused on trying to explain what Warhain has in mind with this idea of a model, um, a kind of paradigm or a worldview, and how it has these kind of functional components of um, giving us a way to make sense of the world, and giving us guidance about how to respond to that world. Um, I actually think there's there's a couple other things I might be able to mention. I was talking about this with my uh, in um, on campus class today. We were we were doing that today, and um, and we had a pre presenter on it too. And I think he really helped with putting some stuff into context. So um, I I didn't really emphasize this as much when I was talking about Warhain and models um, on Tuesday, but Warhain does really think of these things as um, not just being these powerful and maybe overt ideologies, but also the kinds of things that we can be holding in a subconscious way. Um, they're patterns of thinking that we may not be aware of. Um, specifically, you might remember this part of her definition, that it sets up per that a model will set up parameters through which experience or a certain set of experiences is organized or filtered, and that filtered part is pretty important here. The model will sort of, um, it, it's kind of like a computer program that picks out important information. So what things are salient, I love that word, um, which things draw attention and are given importance, what features of a situation spring to mind, um, and how are they given significance is something that will characterize the models that we are using. And models can differ based on what they think of as significant. Um, uh, just a really good example of this uh, in my personal life was um, in high school I got exposed to uh, kind of formal philosophical theories of gender, uh, the phenomenon of gender. And before that I, I wasn't really thinking about it very much. I wasn't thinking much about uh, different gender identities or how we perform gender or this sort of shape of expectations we have in society based on someone's gender. I mean I definitely had thoughts about how um, men and women get treated differently um, and that there is inequality and stuff like that but I hadn't really been tracking um, all the kind of subtleties of it and once I had access to that the, uh, theoretically then I was able to sort of see explicitly and intentionally something that I wasn't noticing before and things jumped out to me more um, certain patterns of behavior in other people and myself took on a uh, greater significance but also I just was tracking it like I wasn't before I wasn't thinking about it as much and then after I sort of changed the model that I was using um, I was able to recognize that so that's another part of models they're not always explicit and rational and conscious they can also be subconscious too um, I really like this phrase my pastor actually loves to use it all the time uh, you, you may have heard it before too but a fish doesn't know it's wet that is kind of how we're like with our paradigms very often. And a big part of Warhain's contribution in this article is really just to get us to rethink um, our, our paradigms of capitalism. If we come, I think, I think Warhain is definitely speaking more to a Western audience here. 
uh, Western philosophers um, that might already be sort of definitely at least exposed to, if not sold, on the virtues of capitalism in terms of its moral justification in the, the way in which the paradigm of capitalism protects certain values or enables or creates the opportunity for certain values to actually be manifested. Um, and I, it's not that she's opposed to capitalism. That's a very important point to make about what she's arguing for. She's not saying capitalism is stupid or immoral or unethical or anything like that at all. What she's trying to get us to do is to recognize what is the real shape of that model, the, this capitalist mindset, like how capitalism is a lens that we could look through the world through. And our, some things are going to jump out to us more, other things less. We might not be tracking certain other phenomenon, and there's other ones that will definitely come to the forefront if we're thinking about the world in terms of capitalism. Um, and, and to sort of notice that, notice all those features, and see how there are other situations um, and other paradigms that don't play by the same rules necessarily, and to think about how we are going to apply that paradigm um, to make sense of situations that are maybe not as familiar to us or um, that we don't maybe understand quite as well, that might have features that we might not expect if we're using the model not only of capitalism, but capitalism in our context of it, uh, in the context of developed Western countries. Um, and that's really her main warning. Um, in the paper, uh, she, she is um, she's kind of in the same vein as Velasquez in terms of trying to give us reasons for pause in how we apply things that otherwise we might think of as straightforward answers. Like, duh, this would be the right thing for the, to have happen here. Or that's how the world works. You know, those kinds of judgments that we can make. Um, she wants us to notice the models of capitalism that we're using and try to ask the, ourselves a question. It, when it's legitimate, why did it work? Or what makes capitalism legitimate? Um, and how could maybe there be circumstances which are different? So Wergen is not as pessimistic as Velasquez. So even though there's this kind of skepticism that's a part of what she's talking about, um, it does. it's not like she doesn't think that there's an answer. And she does offer a solution to the problem that she draws our attention to in this article. So there's kind of like two movements to it. In the first part of the paper, she's like, well, maybe there's some concerns here things that we should be tracking. This may not be so straightforward of an answer, um, but then she tries to uh, overcome those challenges, overcome those hurdles, uh, to beat back that skepticism with a more robust answer, something that's maybe a little more thoughtful, a little more sensitive, um, and takes seriously the kinds of ethical concerns that could happen if we just applied our paradigm of capitalism in a ham-fisted, sort of straightforward kind of way. Um, so it's very important to, I think, emphasize that the conclusion that she's going for is not that capitalism is bullshit. She's not. In fact, she's pretty sympathetic to it. So um, when she starts talking about the model of free enterprise, free market capitalism, this kind of thing, she talks about it in the context of Western history. And I think does a pretty good job of articulating why it is that um, Western cultures have been and they're not, you know, they're not all the same, and not everyone in Western cultures agrees on this sort of thing. Um, but those parts of Western culture that uh, celebrate capitalism, that encourage capitalism, that are convinced that it's the right way to go, uh, that there's some good reason for that, especially considered historically. Um, for, for Europe and the West, um, there was uh, a kind of story of... Um, capitalism providing a kind of liberation from feudalism and what are seen as the like moral evils of feudalism now there's a little bit of there's there's a lot of commentary um, on capitalism as a paradigm in sociology and I have seen some sociologists who argue that uh, to see feudalism as uh, demeaning uh, humiliating the way that uh, Warhane talks about it here um, that it takes away people's freedom um, that it doesn't allow people to live independent lives of self-reliance, um, this kind of thing. Uh, 
that might be a little anachronistic. It might be something that now that we're in a capitalist culture, we like read those values into feudalism. But there's a good argument to be made that feudalism is not appropriate. Um, I'm, uh, my, my memory banks are, are uh, flagging for me um, some history lectures that I uh, was watching online from a, a Cambridge history professor um, who was arguing that um, he, 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 he was a medieval scholar, so he studies medieval history. And he had a little bit of an axe to grind about the way that contemporary people, whether they're academics or not, um, kind of poo-poo the medieval period as this backwards time. Um, he says there, uh, people are a little snooty about um, the medieval time period, and he tries really hard in his history lectures. I just like to like this. I just watch them for fun, for self-edification. I'm not a I'm not a history scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but he was in his lectures. He was always trying to show how people of the time understood the significance of their uh, world conditions. And he, he argued when it, when it came to feudalism particularly and serfdom, that serfs in feudalism saw it as uh, like job security. That it was like, it's a good thing to be a serf. And not just because they've been sort of brainwashed into this humiliating social position or something. There were people who were free in that society who were not serfs. Um, but they didn't have a lot of opportunity in the, in the world conditions of that time. Um, so maybe comparatively we could say being a serf was a better position, that it had it provided stability. You could like have a family and have some, some job security and some, some trust that there was livelihood. Because the, the serfdom relationship, even, even though in many ways it, it's kind of not that far removed from slavery, um, it still did provide um, protection for serfs. Like, the Lord wasn't interested in just abusing all of his serfs um, because they were basically the Lord's economic engine. So he wanted to take care of them. There was a kind of, it was, it was a little of a two way street. It was totally asymmetrical when it came to power. Um, and I think that's where there's still a good argument for capitalism versus feudalism is that if you are thinking about the overall social conditions. Um, people under capitalism have more freedom and with still having a certain modicum of security and stability um, than people living in feudalistic conditions um, as serfs. So that still, there still is a moral argument to be made there. Um, but I think it does, it's kind of, the, the think about it from this more nuanced historical perspective is exactly the kind of thing that Werhain is trying to get us to draw our attention to. But what she also wants to, her, the other point that she'd want to make here in talking about the virtues of free market capitalism is to emphasize how in the history of Western civilization, specifically in Europe, um, and some other examples elsewhere, but especially in Europe, um, capitalism brought moral progress. Um, and that, but that might be in some ways because of our particular historical conditions and circumstances um, that we were working with. So it was able to be this kind of liberating force, moral force, um, for those times and in those conditions. But it might be possible, and this is what Warhain wants us to think more carefully about, it might be possible that the same system of capitalism wouldn't produce a social arrangement that would have all of those values in other situations. Or there's, there's going to be other circumstantial complications that would get in the way of the model of capitalism and, and free enterprise, free market uh, transactions, and private property conventions uh, that won't yield. Um, and basically these two values that have always been used to defend capitalism, that won't yield greater autonomy and uh, independence and freedom, liberty, and then also this efficiency. So that's another argument that's always given in defense defense of capitalism is that if you let market forces decide uh, things in the economy rather than say under uh, uh, something more like communism like a totalitarian type of communism um, that's just or, or like really extreme socialism like state-run markets are not going to be as efficient as letting market forces 
of uh, supply and demand sort of set what's going to happen. Um, so that efficiency thing. Yeah, yeah, Li Ling, you're here. Hello, I'm happy someone is here. Uh, yeah, right now it's just you and me. <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Um, oh, so the efficiency argument is the other thing that's always been sort of offered in favor of capitalism. And what that boils down to in terms of a moral argument is that capitalist social arrangements are going to um, promote people's well-being. They're going to raise the standard of living um, in a society. And that's another, um, that's another point. Oh, Li Ling, so you had a hard time joining the, the um, call? What happened? Did the link not work? Oh, no. Okay. Um, here, I'm going to pause the video and fix that. Okay, um, so that's the that's where um, Werhain begins with being like, here's the sort of moral basis for um, why free market capitalism would be a justifiable paradigm, and she doesn't do that just to set it up to say that it's wrong, um, like maybe some of the other papers you've read in the, in the class have been like, here's a position, and now I'm going to attack it. Um, Warhane isn't doing that. I think she sincerely believes that there's something about capitalism that is valuable um, and worth making available to uh, people who come uh, from cultures and communities that don't have capitalism. But what she definitely thinks is not appropriate is just kind of importing our model of capitalism straight into another country. In, in my class earlier today, we ended up talking a little bit about colonialism, and I think that's sort of a relevant factor here um, about whether, and this is definitely something I think Velasquez is worried about too, with the idea of local bias, right, that we'd be imposing a set of moral standards that are not truly universal, and I think Werhein is worried about that too, but she's worried about a universality in a different direction. She thinks capitalism as we know it, in the details of how we do it, um, like capitalism today in the West, you might say, worked, worked for us um, because of our circumstances, but maybe under different circumstances it wouldn't work as well. And that's where she brings up all these case examples. These are not uh, supposed to be uh, arguments to the effect of, see, look at what happens when you've got capitalism. She's not cherry-picking examples of failure to show that capitalism is wrong. What she's doing is saying, look, it might not go the way that you expect it will. It's not like if you just bring capitalism as this like gift to other countries or other communities that you're, it's really going to have this kind of positive intended effect that you'd hope it would. Um, I, I have this note here at the beginning of, the, of Werhain here where I say when she's talking about this model of free enterprise, she's not thinking about a bunch of like a kind of uncharitable view of capitalists as just these – sketchy, skeezy people who are looking to make a buck off people and exploit them. Um, that's not the point. It's not to try to rationalize uh, multinational corporations just going in and having their way with a foreign country and a community of people. That's not the point. The point is that maybe there's something that is true about capitalism that makes it a progressive model for uh, purposes of social justice, that it is actually a benefit to people um, on moral grounds with regard to like freedom um, and autonomy and stuff like that, but also on grounds of just improving their lives, being able to have a more robust functioning economy that's gonna, in, that's gonna increase people's standard of life and well-being. Um, that more, much more charitable uh, figure who is convinced of capitalism or, or who's running capitalism as a model, that's what Warhain wants to address. That's the person she wants to be talking to. So the point is not to convince them that it's actually bullshit, but to say, hey, look, we got to be careful about this. I'm not going to run through all the details of these cases, um, but in, in a kind of summary of these, um, whether it's the case of the Philippines and the farmers in the Philippines, the Hitos in Mexico, the neem tree in India, 
the self program in Africa or the um, Nestle infant case. Uh, I can tell you about this. Um, some of you might already know about it. It's a pretty famous scandal. Um, I would just Google it, uh, search for it, and you can get a pretty quick description of it. But basically, um, Nestle thought that there's like this untapped market in Africa uh, where they could sell their infant formula. And they didn't take into account, like, like uh, in some ways, baby formula has a lot of advantages in, say, a country like America. There's some good reasons why someone might choose uh, to use formula instead of breastfeeding their babies. Um, but the circumstances in Africa were different, like access to um, non-polluted water, uh, the spread of disease was a big factor, um, the poverty meant that um, people would buy formula but then kind of water it down to make it s stretch longer, so there are a lot of kids being malnourished. Um, lots of other factors are at play there that made it just a total disaster. Um, the, there was a lot of really uh, big protests around this. The infant mortality rates just started skyrocketing, um, and that was a problem. And the question about accountability for Nestle was it's a whole nother bag of tricks, but it, it's like one of those things that could this have been avoided? Potentially. I think Warhane in many ways is, is not saying look at all these reasons in all these cases why we shouldn't mess around with other countries or try to bring our brand of capitalism to them or something like that. She's not saying multinational corporations are evil. Um, she's saying you got to be aware of the particular uh, circumstances that are different from what you might be used to. The models that you've constructed for dealing with your life experience don't always work in other cases that don't have the same circumstances. This kind of fish doesn't know it's wet thing. Um, you might not recognize all the sort of logical and rational connections you've been making for sorting out all the different things that you have to confront, the kinds of problems you have, what's significant about them, and figuring out what to do about them. Um, a really good example of this might be this class. <laughs> so um, you might have, uh, you might have had coming into this class a lot of moral intuitions about certain scenarios or what actions would be moral or immoral, um, what would be the right thing to do, that kind of stuff. Um, and then you might have looked at some of the circumstances that we're talking about or some of the theoretical questions or uh, puzzles, issues of perplexity that we've been studying in this class and been like, I don't know what to think of this. Um, it might have felt like a different territory. And when you're thinking about your moral intuitions sort of being stretched and pushed to their breaking point, uh, theoretically, by a philosophical criticism, it might have felt a little bit like, well, was I just like a dummy or something for like not thinking about these problems or whatever? And the answer is no. Your intuitions are formed based on the kinds of things that you have to deal with. The purpose of philosophy is to test these things outside of the normal circumstances that we're familiar with, push them into circumstances we're not familiar with, and think, is there a better answer that can deal with all of those cases? Um, sometimes knowing about circumstances that we're unfamiliar with helps us to get a better idea of what would be a better evaluation of the cases we are familiar with. This is one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of science fiction. You know, I'm a big Star Trek fan and stuff like that. Um, but I also really love, like, the classics of... Uh, science fiction. I like Heinlein a lot and Asimov. And one of the things that science fiction is good for is putting us into an unfamiliar setting or set of circumstances and asking familiar philosophical and ethical questions. Um, even though those are circumstances we're never going to face or aren't going to face for maybe a very long time, um, if you've ever read science fiction or watched science fiction and been like, I felt like I got some wisdom out of that, even though it's about a, a scenario that I'll never have to face, um, there could be some relevance because we're thinking about things a little more universally. And that's what Wurheim wants us to do. Um, there's ways in which we can anticipate and be sensitive to these differences um, and find ways to make better answers. And that is kind of where I want to get here. Um, this is getting into Wurheim, the second half of Wurheim's paper. Um, she says she wants to, in her answer to this situation, there's going to be kind of two main themes. One is um, a kind of moderate position that she wants to take, 
And then the other thing is about um, uh, shoot, I just lost it. Um, uh, hooey. Um, mm. Oh, I hate it when this happens. Oh, just give me a second. Mm. That was it. Um, a kind of dialogue that happens between different entities, uh, like different between cultures, an intercultural dialogue that can um, maybe create something new. That it's not all or nothing sort of thing. They're actually those two themes are very much related. Um, in, when it comes to this moderism thing, uh, moderation thing, she says. Um, we shouldn't see the dilemma of international business and intercultural moral disagreement as a cho having to choose between two extreme positions. Either abandon the notion of any kind of global standard of well-being that there that we can't make judgments about how you know increased freedom is a good or higher standard of living is a good or something like that. Um, we don't we don't need to go with relativism. Or on the other hand. Um, transform the world into, as she puts it, versions of Dallas, Texas. Um, we don't need to make the entire rest of the world look exactly like ourselves, what she calls a kind of parochial absolutism. So um, where Velasquez is like, there are these two options, they both fail. Wurheen is like, well, not that we should do a little bit of both. She actually is more of an absolutist, but she thinks that when it comes to like a practical implementation here, it's not a choice between my culture versus your culture. That there's a way in which there's something new that could be born out of a dialogue that happens between those things. So she, she in some ways, and, and in the discourse in America today, public discourse today, sometimes is considered uh, a pejorative term by some people, but she is a kind of globalist. She does think that globalization, whether we like it or not, is kind of here to stay. Um, the trajectory has definitely been going in this direction and there's kind of no stopping it. Um, our economies are increasingly more interwoven with each other. Um, the internet has made the world a smaller place. We're connecting a lot more. We're more and more part of a shared community of the planet. And uh, the way to move forward on that is to not have some groups trying to push their culture onto everybody else or to have uh, cultures like block out everyone else and become isolationists about things. She thinks in the process of globalization, if we allow it to be a critical dialogue, can create newer and better things that we can progress in our understanding of what a just society would look like or what kind of economic models are really best for humanity. Um, while respecting that there is a lot of diversity of opinion about that, the way to do that is, in her mind, is to create a dialogue around it. That's a little bit of my language, but um, that I think fits what where she's trying to go with this. So let's talk about this a little bit. The place that she starts, and this is why I think she definitely is on the absolutist camp. So in, in some ways you could sort of see Warhane trying to do exactly what Velasquez was asking for. Um, we need some new absolutist model because the existing absolutist models have Western bias in them. And I think that, that Warhane is kind of on the same page here with Velasquez. But she's actually going to give us something to maybe sink our teeth into as a proposal here. So sh her starting point is to say, well, even if we disagree about a lot of the good things in life or what would be ideal, um, certain things about social expectations or what a just society is principled on, stuff like that, um, we definitely can find some common ground to start this dialogue through these sorts of uh, basic bads or moral minimums that we seem to have pretty large cultural consensus on. In other words, it's not like there are cultures on the planet that think of human suffering as a positive thing, or that abject poverty is something that is not a problem. Um, preventable disease, I got on the list here. High mortality rates, especially infant mortality rates. Um, violence. Um, there's not, uh, <clears throat> for the, any of you who watch Star Trek, there's not like a Klingon race that's just like going around being like violence is good or something like that. I mean, there there are these things that we all believe are things that get in the way of the good things. And the good things we have different ideas about. Like what are the things worth pursuing in life? What are the things that are the best or that are deserving of the most priority? 
but on these basic bads that we can agree on, that gives us a starting point, a foundation where Hayden thinks. She's not proposing that we can use those agreements as, um, as a standard that answers all of the questions, but they are something that we can use to test various answers, um, various proposals, and see whether it's, is it making more of that happen or less of that, um, while we're having the dialogue about the other things that we don't agree on. Okay, <clears throat> she also says, um, another sort of big move that she makes here in her proposal of an alternative is to say that um, economic benefit needs to be kind of broadened in, in terms of how we understand that. So our model of capitalism sees economic growth in a very particular way. And um, I think that's in, there's some conversation that's happening even internally to Western cultures right now about this. Um, instead of like a gross na uh, national product, we think about, uh, we've got some people doing research programs trying to measure a gross national happiness, like a happiness index, things like that. There's actually a big project of like that going on at UW, and there's some really famous ones across the planet too, people, entire countries who are trying to think about their success using other metrics. And, and uh, Warhain thinks that part of that notion of economic value needs to include not just money, but also uh, social goods, as she puts it, um, kind of cultural goods. And I, um, I put in a little note here about what would Velasquez say, because I think he, he would have a concern about this. Remember his concern about why would you, uh, the, the appeal to these are the values of a certain community, therefore they're right, he thinks of as arbitrary. There needs to be a stronger case made for that. That was his argument against relativism, Velasquez's. Um, and I think he might be a little suspicious here. He's like, okay, keep talking here, Warhain. Let's see, are you going to give me something more substantial? Um, and then she does maybe, to cash this out a little bit, she says, what matters are social relationships, family, religious, and community traditions and values. Now that's something a little bit more than just, this is how people do it, so it's good. <clears throat> She's saying relationships have objective value. She wants to commit to that. Relationships can happen in a lot of different ways. So she's kind of saying that, that I might be putting words in her mouth here, so I want to be careful. Maybe, maybe I should say one way you could take that idea to try to cash it out and run with it a little bit more would be to say maybe it doesn't matter quite as much the individual ways in which a culture builds those relationships. It's the relationships itself, the kind of community, uh, that is what's valuable. So, for example, um, you can definitely think of counterexamples. I can think of counterexamples to what I just said. Uh, like if the way that um, a <laughs> like a Ku Klux Klan members have a community, they have a community that binds them together around their shared racism and sense of superiority over minorities that's probably not a valuable thing, right? There's moral concerns about that. So it's not like anything goes for how to make a, a, a relationship or a community happen. Um, but when it comes to other things, like say different cultures have different festivals or they have different traditions for how to uh, celebrate family, um, different foods, different cooking, you know, that kind of, those things are not moral matters as much. Um, there are ways in which they can sometimes, there's some gray areas about that where they might seem to maybe be crossing some kinds of lines. Um, certainly uh, things like, um, well, things like racism and sexism can get pretty interwoven to a culture to the point where it's really hard to separate them. Um, so there can be, there might be need for reform, but there's a lot of other aspects of those traditions and ceremonies and, uh, ide and shared identities that can probably be preserved in order to value those relationships. To break them would be to threaten those relationships and Warhain thinks in most cases that's not a good thing for them to be destroyed. So um, a culture gives a sense of connection and community. And I think that that might be an attempt that she might make for some absolutist objective judgment that um, would grant some uh, objective legitimacy to why 
local customs should be respected. That's not just the relativistic arbitrary worry that Belast has had of because they believe it, therefore it's good. Um, okay, so I, that's a little bit of her suggestion. The other part of it is about the conversation. But actually, if I can, I, I want to check in with Li Ling. How's this going so far? Do you have any questions about what I've said so far? Good? Okay. Cool. Um, so the other the other big idea that I think Warhane is putting on the table here is this idea of a creative destruction. So she thinks um, instead of, so the, the, again, think back to the two extremes. Say a multinational corporation goes into a, uh, another country and then just starts forcing the people who interact with that company to um, do so in accordance with, say, the values of the, the um, culture, the, the, the country that uh, the company originates from. Um, that would be one thing. So like just importing American culture, for example, of, of like an American corporation. Um, that would be, in Warhane's uh, argument, a bad thing. Um, that it's insensitive to how things can go wrong, how circumstances can be different. You need to update the models. Um, but on the other hand, to just straightforwardly respect uh, indigenous culture as a kind of sacred thing that you can't mess with, she doesn't agree with that either. Um, what she thinks is that there will be, if you have a respectful presence that is done with sensitivity um, and flexibility with the surrounding culture, a multinational can sort of, the presence of a multinational can create a kind of dialogue between the model of capitalism and Western values that are connected with it and whatever's going on in that indigenous culture of the country where the, the, the capitalist multinational corporation uh, is setting up shop. And in the process of adapting the things that might actually be valuable about capitalism to that culture, trying to like supplement it, um, then she thinks we're going to actually maybe get an evolution of capitalism itself. Uh, the capitalist model won't look the same. It'll change. It'll evolve just as much as the culture that this multinational is operating in is also going to change. And she just embraces that. She thinks that's fine. That, that can be a good thing. It's not something we need to be afraid of. And that's why I think it is fair to call her a globalist, is she's not so worried about sort of preserving certain cultures so that they go unchanged forever. She is really comfortable with allowing them to develop and evolve, uh, and that we'll all benefit from it. Um, I think Warhane is really suggesting that there's a kind of value um, that we stand to get from seeing multinationals exporting capitalism to other places. And to see how they evolve, they could bring those insights back to us, and we could change too. I think that's definitely something Warhane has in mind. Um, as a part of this point about adding in a sensitivity to cultural and social goods, that's why she brings up this example of Unilever and the triple bottom line. Now, I do want to say, um, and I think if you do your research, and you should do your research, the kind of rosy picture that she paints of Unilever in the article is not really accurate. Um, there are, and Unilever is a corporation like any other, management leadership changes over time. And maybe this move by Unilever to have this triple bottom line to basically say, we're going to consider ourselves successful, not just in terms of uh, economic success in the sense of making profit, but also whether we're able to preserve the things that really are valuable in indigenous cultures, while also adding cultural value on top of that, um, maybe with the capitalist stuff that they, they bring in to, uh, as well and also to think about ecological and environmental values as well as something that needs to be preserved, maintained, supported, sustained, um, and maybe even encouraged uh, and developed. Um, those are also things that they're going to be thinking about. So <clears throat> instead of, that's why it's called a triple bottom line, because it's a matter of where does the buck stop? For most companies, the buck stops with the buck. It stops with profit and whether you're maximizing profit or losing money. That's what it all comes down to. Everything else is just a means for that as the end. For Unilever with this triple bottom line, at least on paper, theoretically, the idea is that 
economic value is now being expanded across multiple continuums. Um, and you're going to balance these things a little bit more. So that, um, my presenter today in my in, on-campus class said, it sounds a lot like stakeholder theory, and I think that's exactly right. That kind of balancing act of not just the profit for the shareholders, but also what's going on for the employees, the people who live in the communities where the company is operating. I mean, all the stakeholders, everyone who's affected or could be affected by the operation of the business, uh, we're thinking about them. But the triple bottom line is saying, we're gonna think about them not just in terms of dollar signs, even for their sake, but also we need to be tracking these other kinds of cultural values and, and we have to be tracking the, the environmental stuff too. So, um, uh, yeah, Unilever has not uh, stuck to this all the time, and there have been some big scandals involving them in the 2000s, uh, in the 21st century here. So definitely, there's I can't I can I'm very hard pressed to come up with corporations that really put their money where the mouth is. Um, a lot, you'll see a lot more companies sort of talking about things like triple bottom lines. Um, actually, this is my, my son was just playing with this. Lego is a good example of that. But I've actually done some more research into Lego as a case example. And it's like, yeah, they're doing some things, but like stuff where, that just seems to be an excuse for them to say, to pay lip service to these sorts of uh, stated values, like as a mission statement. I'm not sure that Lego is really thinking about each of those three axes of success as being equal. Um, and needing to be balanced with each other. Um, but they definitely talk a big game about that. And, and don't get me wrong, I love Lego, but <laughs> um, I think they could be doing much more robust things in terms of running their company in line with their principles. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, one thing that Unilever has done that I think is is pretty interesting and exactly what Working is thinking about, and this was, I think, after Working published this paper, um, Unilever was doing these, um, what do you call them? Um, you probably have heard of these before. It's, it's come up a lot more in the news. Um, they're uh, micro grants and micro investments. In other words, they try, they try out little experimental things, kind of like the self, the uh, example that she talks about with the uh, solar panels and the generators in, uh, in Africa. They're, they're like these little projects that get tried out and they all, and when Unilever had a whole branch that was devoted to this, and it was kind of like an R&D branch. Uh, it was looking for innovative new markets. New, uh, they, and, and, and a lot of them, and this is what was kind of cool about them, a lot of these were not like Unilever's like, we got a product we want to sell you. It was more like working with people in a community to be like, what are the things that you're looking for? What are, what are the things that you value and need? looking for what is the demand and trying to figure out how there could be this kind of conversation of like Unilever is a massive corporation. They get into so many different things that they've got this kind of flexibility to be like, we can probably hook this up, right? We can make these opportunities possible and maybe open up new markets that aren't, that don't currently exist. And that's exactly what we're hearing is thinking too, that there could be, um, some lucrative new opportunities for markets that otherwise uh, and markets not in the sense just of economic profit, but also uh, ways in which the economy, this system of uses of resources and means of production, can be mobilized to increase the value of people's in people's lives. Kind of like, but maybe in a different path or with a different narrative, kind of like how capitalism in the story, the history of Western civilization, opened up something like the Enlightenment. In many ways, capitalism can, it, it at least needs some partial credit for paving the way to enable the philosophies and the ideas of the Enlightenment to happen, um, which are philosophies like Kant and Mill, like you were reading earlier this quarter, theories of a, a drastic change in perspective in Western civilization toward egalitarianism, uh, liberalism, a concern about freedom, autonomy, the dignity and respect for all people. Um, those are really, really big things, um, big ideas. And the, and the Western world has never been the same since. In many ways, America is really the child of the Enlightenment, and its values are still very much with us. So maybe there are these 
new places in which there are other little transformations and evolutions that can occur that um, advances us as a species. Um, so that's that's Warhammer. Um, maybe I, I uh, belabored that a little much. I am very eager to get into Arnold. Um, that's the next thing that we're going to be talking about. Um, but let me know if you've got questions with Warhain. Um There's actually quite a lot going on in that article, I think. Um, but I'm going to move on to Arnold here. Maybe after a little break. Does that sound good for you, Liling? I, I am getting tired here. I think I need to take a short break. So I'm going to do that. All right, we're back. All right, so let's do Arnold. Um, and I do have uh, in the module here the Declaration, the UN Declaration of Human Rights as uh, in its entirety, so you can kind of take a look at the whole thing if you want to. I'm not going to um, belabor it too much here in the lecture tonight. Um, I, I'm just going to kind of focus on Arnold, but I think it's good reading as a supplement. Uh, you might just be interested in it. You might be interested in what did the UN sort of agree to here? There, there actually, um, there were some countries that didn't um, agree to the UN. Am I, did I mention this in the lecture on Velasquez? Maybe. I, I definitely think it's worth looking at the Declaration of Human Rights and being like, how much Western bias is going on here? Um, or could these things be defended in a way that doesn't rely on Western bias? Like, remember, just because something looks Western doesn't mean it's biased. The concern is whether there can be given a universally valid argument to defend and justify that value. Um, remember, like Velasquez says, um, by universally valid, I don't mean everyone agrees to it, um, but that just an argument could be given that doesn't rely on coming from a certain cultural background in order to see the logic of it or to see why that argument should be found compelling. So it, it definitely, if you're looking at the... Um, Declaration of Human Rights document and analyzing it for bias, your analysis has to go a lot deeper than just recognizing a pattern of Western thinking. And that's something I think I mentioned before about bias, that I kind of have an axe to grind about it, um, that bias is something more than just recognizing a pattern to thinking um, and thinking that is problematic. Um, pattern thinking is exactly what we're trying to do if we're trying to avoid having double standards in our moral judgments, right? <laughs> or being hypocrites or something like that. So, uh, but I think it's worth going through that and kind of thinking about that. Um, like I say here, <clears throat> if some of these values are not universally held, the real question in here is, should they be? Um, and then thinking about which ones might be the most relevant to business and how should a business integrate uh, something like this UN charter, uh, or I'm sorry, this UN resolution about this this Declaration of Human Rights. Um, how How should it use that to inform policy decisions and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> the reason why this is good background for Arnold is that one, Arnold cites the document, but also he, what he's going to be doing in his paper is trying to defend straightforwardly against Velasquez's concerns, like just jumping right into that conversation, how you can use the theory of human rights to solve this sort of perplexing issue of international business, of how to adjudicate cross-cultural moral disagreement. And there's going to be a few stages here to uh, Arnold's argument, um, but he's, he's really going to meet the challenge that Velasquez presented head-on, um, and that's what the first unit is about. Uh, how can we justify human rights in a way that's really truly universal to all cultures, that isn't just human rights sound good to me because I come from a Western society that I've been told human rights are good since I was a little kid, um, that I'm just brainwashed into thinking things this way or adopting this lens through which I look through the world. Um, if we took the glasses off and we were like, yeah, does it make sense to wear these glasses? Could we come up with an independent reason, you know, once we detach ourselves from that, for why it would be justified to put them back on? And that's what Arnold thinks can be done. And in this first section here, he's going to attempt to do that. The second question, um, the second movement of the paper, if you will, is going to be if we can sort of theoretically defend the, the idea of human rights as a appropriate moral framework to be used universally and objectively across all cultures, then the next question is, okay, what content do those human rights have? Um, 
with, uh, there's definitely a lot more opportunities for parochial bias to enter in here. So we need to have, again, a principled argument to justify why these rights and not those rights. Like, what gets in and what gets out. You can make rights about anything, theoretically. The question is, which ones would be appropriate to assign that special moral significance? And then finally, there's this section I, I'm calling application in my lecture notes. And I think the, the right way to think about this movement is going to be, Arnold is going to say, uh, this is kind of, I think, think about it in conversation with Friedman, Milton Friedman. Remember, Friedman said, uh, I don't want to have managers being social engineers. I don't want businesses to have social responsibilities and thus managers to have social responsibilities because managers are going to be really shitty at it. They're, they don't know about issues of justice, what makes for a just society. They're not in the, in the business of policy making the way like politicians are. Um, they're not the right people for the job, basically. And Arnold in this section is going to say, uh, yeah, they are the right people for the job. So this is kind of responding to the concern of, oh yeah, human rights might work as an international standard. Um, of morality and even for business ethics but businesses shouldn't be thinking about that when they're running their businesses that we shouldn't be giving them this kind of role or job to do and Arnold's gonna say poppycock that doesn't follow because and the basic argument is gonna be think about the the kinds of skills that you select for in hiring managers just if you want to make a profit the kind of skill set that managers have is exactly the skill set you would need to be running the company with an eye to human rights. Um, there is going to be some mention here of ideas from Warhane again too, so there's there's some conversation happening there. Arnold's going to kind of pull a lot of things together here that we've been talking about, but that's what's going to happen in the sort of third part. So that's the overall paper. It's going to have these three movements, um, but let's start at the beginning. So first step. How can human rights be justified in a universal way? And what Arnold's going to really lean on here is a Kantian argument. And I'm so happy we studied Kant already because that makes this a lot easier. If you had just been given this paper without the Kant background, I think it would have been much harder to understand what's happening here. Um, and there's a little bit of difference in technical terminology from the language Kant was using, but it's really the same idea. Um, Kant, remember, is trying to say that the grounds for a moral law, the ultimate justification for the moral law is this kind of transcendental argument that in order to make any judgment of something being good, you have to commit rationally to this idea of the categorical imperative. So um, basically, there's some things that are moral minimums, that are necessary moral laws, only because there's no way for us to will anything else. Remember Kant was saying that the moral law comes from within us. It doesn't come from an external source. It doesn't come from God. It doesn't come from a government. It doesn't come from a company that set up shop in your company uh, or in your country from some foreign country that's now imposing these values on you. Kant is saying the categorical imperative is something that you find in just the structure of thought and judgment itself. That just the capacity of being self-determining and giving writing your own rules for your conduct, being an autonomous person, being self-determining, means that you're committing yourself logically with necessity to these judgments that say you can't contradict yourself and you got to treat people as ends instead of as means. Like that, those two basic ideas we talked about with Kant, Kant thinks necessarily follow from just willing anything at all or making any judgment of good no matter what culture you're talking about, right? Cultures differ based on what they say is good. But they all make judgments about what is good. And that's where Kant gets his foot in the door. And that's what's happening here with Arnold and this other philosopher, uh, Gewirth. Um, so a little slightly different language here. I, I, what I was just giving you was kind of like a refresher on Kant. Um, the slightly different language, but they're saying, what does it mean to be uh, human? Well, it's to be a person. Now, a person is a special category. Uh, it's a moral category when we're talking moral philosophy. Um, personhood is not just being homo sapien, um, not just being a, a human species instance thing. Um, being a person means 
you are an entity that has moral significance. Um, but before we get into that kind of status, um, there's more of a functional thing that we could point to. Kant talked about it in terms of having the faculty of reason. Reason is the thing that enables you to write your own programming instead of just acting on inclinations like your psychology, which is determined by causal laws of nature, which you did not decide on, you did not create, you did not endorse. They work on your will regardless of whether you agree or are even aware of it. But it's through reason that we can design rules for our own behavior. Those kinds of what Kant would call maxims or judgments of practical reason, they're talking about in this paper as second order desires and preferences. In other words, preferences about your preferences. So think about like judgments of good that I make about my inclinations. Remember I was saying for Kant that to be rational doesn't mean that you have zero emotional, emotional intelligence. In fact, to be uh, rational for Kant, you probably need to have a high degree of emotional intelligence. You need to be aware of what is going on in you and then making judgments about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, sometimes following your feelings can be the right thing to do. But if you're doing that intentionally, you're still acting on reason. You're acting on the rational judgment that you should follow what your feelings say. And in other situations, you might say not. Um, do you remember my old example about um, my brother, you'd get angry when he was a kid. My mom said, you know, when you feel angry, go punch your pillow instead of doing something else. When he's angry, and then he goes and punches his pillow instead of punching me, um, that is acting on reason with reference to your emotions. That would be a second order desire or preference. Something about the other one. Okay, so this is slightly different language. There are some philosophical disagreements that can happen here between Kant and this Gerwit, uh, the Gerwith, ah, I can never say his name, Gerwith's version of this. Um, I'm not going to get into that here. If you're curious, like, look me up. I'm always down to talk more. You know that. Um, but in the broad stroke levels, they're, they're very similar to each other. In order to act, this is what Gawarf says, which is very Kantian-esque. To act in any way at a second order level, if I'm thinking intentionally about what I want to do, what I agree to, what I don't agree to, whether I'm in an individualistic culture or a collectivist culture, I, can, I, I think about what I'm going to do. I do things for reasons. Um, either way, I have to acknowledge, according to Gawarth, the necessary value in freedom and well-being. Not in maybe a more loaded cultural sense, like the way individualism might have it, right? Not that, like, my freedom is more important than the good of my community. It's nothing like that. It's just to say that there's a basis on which if I don't value freedom itself, my ability to make choices, or well-being in the sense of I want to have the resources to be able to act on my choices. I need to be, I want, I will to be empowered to be able to make a follow through on that choice and make it a reality. I always will these things anytime I will anything else. So let's actually take a look at it from like the more collectivist side, because that's what Velasquez would be worried about here, right? That's where Arnold's going to have some burden of proof to shoulder. Let's say I want to will in faith, I want to do a course of action for the sake of the community that involves kind of sacrificing some of my own happiness for the sake of the community. Um, I might be having a second order desire or preference here that gets in the way of a first order desire of selfishness or something like that. Like just because you're in a collectivist culture doesn't mean you don't have selfish inclinations. Like that can still happen. <laughs> um, there are plenty of uh, instances of selfish behavior in collectivist societies. It's still a part of humanity, but in a collectivist culture, there's a, a judgment that's made about that that says selfishness is really a problem here. To be tempted to prioritize my own good above the good of the community, or like to say the good of my family or something like that, is not right. That's not good. I have a preference against that. So if I'm acting that way, I'm still having second order preferences, right? But here's, here's what, what Geworth and Kant would say. Even if my object is something like the collective happiness or good or, or harmony or something like that, um, I'm still willing my ability to relate to that choice, to value that thing. I value my ability to value the community. 
and to choose that way instead of choosing to follow my selfish inclinations. So this is what in Kantian language we talk about respect for reason. That it, Kant thinks I necessarily have to respect my faculty of reason as providing my ends for myself. Even if I'm not thinking about that in terms of I can decide what's best for everybody based on my judgment. Nothing arrogant like that, nothing individualistic necessarily. Okay, So even in a collectivist context, this seems to apply. And if I'm willing for the good of the community, I would also treat it as valuable to be empowered for that choice to mean something. In other words, I'd want to have the means at my disposal to be able to act for the sake of the community. Uh, if I don't have any resources at all, then I can't contribute anything. Um, I, I can't make anything that I choose to be or that I judge to be good a reality. Um, in other words, I, and, and we didn't talk about this so much with Kant, and this might be a really important addition to Kant's framework. Kant focuses more on just the value on freedom itself, right? The, the ability to make this kind of rational choice in my mind. Um, let me actually use another tangent here to help explain this. Um, there's a... Uh, Roman philosopher, uh, a Stoic philosopher named Epictetus, and Epictetus was a slave, and he writes a lot about freedom, and um, he says, you can be free even as a slave, and you might be like, Bleh. what, what, but what he's talking about is this kind of Kantian sense of freedom, of the power to be self-determining, he's like, even if your external circumstances are outside of your control, and because you're a slave, right, someone else has complete domination over your life circumstances, they can't control your mind. You still have the power to decide what you're going to judge about that situation. Um, you have choices to make, even if they are choices just about how you're going to look at something, what you're going to value, what meaning you're going to make out of stuff. I mean, it's a choice to see slavery as something tragic. And this isn't. This is not some kind of. I, I would. I would strongly defend Epictetus here as not doing something like blaming the victim, or he's not doing some kind of Kanye West thing like happened recently of like slavery is a state of mind kind of thing or something like that. Um, what he's saying is that there that that other kind of freedom is, doesn't hold a candle to the kind of freedom that the the I don't know how to put this the ground from which all other freedom comes from, the control of your own mind. Epictetus, as a Stoic, is a, like Stoicism is famous for this kind of thing, that they're like, learn what you can control and what you can't control, and don't worry about the stuff that you can't control. Because if you try to be controlled, uh, controlling about things you can't control, you're just going to be miserable and suffer all the time. So real freedom comes from sort of knowing what you are able to do and then doing that. And then feeling good about that, that like uh, you have made choices that you are capable of making. And so the Stoics oftentimes are like, the main space of freedom that you have is your inner life. What judgments? I mean, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not saying Stoicism is correct about all this stuff. But I think it helps to understand where this other component is different from just the base idea of freedom. I mean, maybe, maybe this is also helpful from Epictetus and the Stoics. They would say, it doesn't matter if you have all the money and power and privilege in the world if you don't have freedom and control over yourself. If you don't have that, that kind of mastery of freedom within your inner life of your beliefs and your perspectives and your motives and your values, then it doesn't matter if you have all the resources in the world. You're going to be chaotic, you're out of control, you don't experience freedom. It's not an external thing. It starts from the internal thing. Now, Epictetus also thought slavery was bad. <laughs> he didn't think that slavery was a natural relationship. And when it came to <clears throat> um, the sorts of ethical responsibilities that he thought people had, uh, a lot of Stoics try to ground this on natural relationships, and he thought of slavery as unnatural. So if, if you've got any choice in the matter, you shouldn't be trying to make other people your slaves. That's not a good thing. Um, but if other people make you a slave, you can't do something about it, then, then you still have choice. There is still a space of some freedom. Now, if you can do something about being a slave, maybe you should. That would definitely be very uh, consistent with Epictetus. He's not saying you just have to accept your slavery or something like that. Um, what do you have within your control? 
and your ability to resist, and that might be the right thing to do. The way you might exert your freedom is say, as a slave might be to say, slavery is a moral tragedy and a deep injustice that happens against me, and to acknowledge that and to not be okay with that is probably the right choice. It might be a wrong choice to say, I just need to accept this and be okay with it, to acquiesce to that injustice might be the wrong way to use that freedom. But either way, we're talking about the inner world here of what I have direct control over with my will. It's another factor about whether I have the external circumstances that allow that choice that I make internally to actually manifest externally. And here is where Aristotle is very helpful. If you remember Aristotle, remember he <clears throat> throws into his theory of eudaimonia the necessity of relevant resources from the world like he's saying it's not just a matter of what you choose to do if you're going to realize the excellent life. The world has to cooperate here as well. And that's exactly what Gerworth is trying to do to supplement the Kantian account. If I, if I value my freedom, I also have to value the empowerment for my choices to actually mean something. If I'm a slave and I will to be a painter, um, I'm, that's not going to happen, right? Unless I have the empowerment, the resources, the opportunities available to me to make that happen. Um, so that's another thing that I, of necessity, value if I value anything else. Okay? So, and then the, the next big step here. If I value them for myself with necessity, I must value them for others on pain of rational consistency and rational contradiction. Um, it's built into the nature of rational action, we say. So, what this means is that um, if the basis on which I recognize my own freedom and empowerment as being something good has to do with how I'm a second order being, I'm a rational being, I'm a being that can make judgments of goodness, then if I, unless I'm going to have a hypocritical double standard, I have to be able to universalize that. So anybody who has this ability to be, uh, to have second order preferences automatically uh, it is a good for them to have their freedom and empowerment as well. All other things being equal. Let's not get started about like the fringe cases of if someone decides to use their freedom to violate other people's freedom. That That's a thing of concern. Um, but the, the starting point here is that with all other things being equal, freedom is a good thing and empowerment is a good thing. And where did that come from? Just a recognition I have second order preferences. Any being that has the ability to form second order preferences, um, Arnold's going to say, is a person. So aliens, if an, al an intelligent alien race comes down to Earth, they're people too. Um, so people doesn't is not something speciesist. It's not just talking about homo sapiens. Okay. If this argument succeeds then arguably Arnold has been able to defend a basis for human rights, the, that human rights are going to be based off of this value on freedom and well-being. Uh, I like the word empowerment more. I'm probably going to use that for the rest of this lecture. When we're talking about well-being, we really mean empowerment, resources that give you opportunities for your free choices to mean something. Um, those are, uh, an argument's been offered that's not dependent on a particular cultural bias, like Westernism um, or individualism. Um, these arguments have definitely been pretty big in shaping uh, the course of Western culture and individualism. Um, but if this argument is a good one, its validity doesn't depend on being a part of one of those cultures, right? That's to get the cart before the horse. Or it's like the tail wagging the dog, right? It's the arguments about our basic constitution as the kinds of beings we are, that we do things for reasons, that we have intentions for our actions, that is the ultimate basis that Arnold and Gewirth are and Kant are appealing to for why these are legitimate, authoritative moral standards, and why there's a space for human rights. Um, but uh, Arnold does a good job here to go the extra mile on it, on defending this as not just an artifact of Western bias. Um, the first thing he says, and I, I for the most part, I, I like Arnold's take on this. From I've studied um, Eastern philosophy. Um, I'm not a specialist, I'd say, but it's a hobby. I have told you before, I identify 
about equal parts Lutheran and Buddhist. Buddhism is uh, in Eastern philosophy, and I spent a lot of time thinking about Buddhism. Um, but uh, in my experience of studying Eastern philosophy, it's, it is very diverse and not homogenous, um, as Arnold says. I think that's exactly right, that uh, to talk about Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy in these broad strokes as if they're people that come from those traditions all think the same way about some stuff, that these uh, contrasts and distinctions that we can theoretically form are sort of absolute is just bogus. Um, I've seen a lot of people uh, in the West, in, in America, sort of fetishize Buddhist thinking as being like totally different than Western philosophy. And when you really dig into it and look at the discussions and the debates, the philosophical debates that happen between Buddhists, um, you see a lot of the same conversations that happen in Western philosophy. Um, I think I might have mentioned this guy before when I did Kant. There's a second century Buddhist who is a huge influence. His name is Nagarjuna. He's responsible for the Mudlaman Yama uh, sect of Buddhism, um, the Middle Way school. Um, and he sounds to me, when I read his writings, and I don't think I'm projecting here, I, I was like, you're a different thing. I just want to understand you on your terms. And I look at everything he's saying, and I'm like, wow, this looks like Kant. Like, I sometimes wonder whether Kant is the reincarnation of Nagarjuna. <laughs> Even though they, they are centuries apart. They're like, they're over 15 centuries removed from each other and in different parts of the globe. And yet they come to very similar ideas, solving very, to, as a way to solve very similar philosophical questions. Um, so I, th I think that's intriguing and interesting. Um, so we have to acknowledge that, that Eastern and Western traditions, while distinct and on different paths from each other, it's not like all the ideas within them are the same and different from each other. That internally they're homogenous and between the two traditions they're totally different. They aren't. Um, and there a lot of the same debates that you see happening here end up happening here too. Um, so that's one big point. Um, the other thing is that uh, some Eastern cultures, Arnold says, have had a tradition of respect for human rights. Um, this isn't just a new idea getting imported from the West. East has already had it and thought about it in these terms. Uh, I think that's correct. I think that's correct too from my study of Eastern philosophy. Um, let's talk just for a little couple minutes here about what we mean by a human right. Um, I think the best way to define human rights are to think about them as um, one side of a coin where on the other side are moral obligations. So if I have a right to life, that means all of you have an obligation to not kill me. Okay, so a positive right means, uh, or I guess I should, a positive or a negative right, a freedom for, freedom from, maybe you've heard that distinction before. Um, I don't really like that distinction very much. But whatever value is being protected by a right always involves an obligation for everybody else. Some kind of thing other, other people must do or must refrain from doing. So in some ways, I, I, I've uh, <laughs> personally, as a philosopher, at various times in my life, I've thought, do humans even have rights? I'm not so sure. I'm kind of skeptical, like, whether we are entitled to anything morally whatsoever. But, um, and I, I still kind of think that that's true, actually. I kind of think um, humans, uh, people in general, uh, and this is some of the Buddhism in me talking, don't really deserve anything morally. Like, we're not entitled to anything morally at all. But even for someone like me who flirts with that kind of thinking, um, I am happy to accept the theoretical existence of rights, not on the rights end of that coin or that equation, but on the obligation side of that equation. So while I think we don't, we may be, I, that it'd be wrong, I gotta keep this tilted. While, while I may think, I'm still kind of working this out, whether I want a full-blooded commit to this, but I, like I said, I flirt with it. If I did, though, if I did believe this, even me, even if I adopted that position which said, um, humans don't deserve anything positively, we don't, we're not entitled to anything, we don't have these rights, I still think that we're under moral obligations, that there is um, a reality, there's a space of what is morally ideal and what's not morally ideal. So by committing to 
me thinking it would be wrong for me to kill other people. Um, even if other people don't deserve their life or they're not entitled to it, even if we wanted to take that kind of view, the fact that there's an obligation to not kill them, I still say that's wrong. Absolutely, I say that's wrong. Um, then that, in a negative sort of way, defines a space of a positive right. So the fact that I, it would be wrong for me to kill anyone, in a de facto sort of way, gives everyone a right to life. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. And if we're talking about rights in those terms, if we're talking about human rights in those terms as something that's sort of universal, then definitely Eastern cultures have a notion of rights. Um, that there are these sorts of moral minimums that are owed to everybody. Um, that, that you can definitely find in Eastern cultures and in Eastern traditions too. And then, um, as Ar Arnold sort of also meets Velasquez right on his terms and says, even if not all cultures had a place for human rights, that wouldn't be an argument against their validity. In other words, he says, Westerners don't own human rights. Okay, it's not something that we can, that Westerners can take credit for. So, for example, let's just say, let's say the past point was not true. Um, so, you know, Arnold is saying there are Eastern sources for this sort of thinking about ethics in terms of human rights. Let's say that that was different. Um, uh, and no other culture other than uh, Western cultures ever thought that freedom was a positive thing and that there are these moral minimums that people are owed of autonomy uh, and empowerment, this kind of thing. Um, if one of the, if Western culture was the one to sort of come up with the idea uh, or land on that idea for the first time, that wouldn't mean that it was theirs or that it should be inextricably connected with that culture that that sort of first came up with it. Uh, in the same way that we talk about scientific discoveries, right? Um, it's not like uh, the theory of relativity, Einstein's theory of relativity is um, American or Jewish for that matter. You know, he's Jewish. Um, Einstein was Jewish. Um, it can't be like taken credit for like that. If I'm like, well, I'm I'm uh, I'm from France, so I don't believe in relativity. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. Einstein can't take credit for the existence of, you know, space time or something like that. All he can be credited with is just being the first one to kind of propose that as an idea. I mean, it's not like he made it true. <laughs> it's a truth for everybody. Um, and, and I think that's what Arnold kind of has in mind here about saying that they don't, Westerners wouldn't own human rights, even if they were the only ones to ever think of it. Um, they're not contingent on human institutions. And actually, this is, a, this is another thing that helps to clarify what we mean by a human right. Um, I really love the, uh, the comment and observation that Arnold makes here. I think it's a very important one for this discussion. Um, human rights don't come from a society or a culture. They're a moral reality. And uh, he, uh, Arnold, to explain this idea, contrasts it with legal rights. So he says, you know, you could have your legal rights taken away because legal rights depend on what the law says. And if the law changes, then you don't have those rights anymore. Right? If uh, we had another amendment to the Constitution and it said um, anyone with the name Tim can't vote, boom, my legal rights just got taken away. Just like that. But human rights, moral rights, can't be ever taken away. Sometimes we speak that way, but Arnold says that's a, that's a mistake of language. That's an inaccuracy of language to say, oh, uh, you know, this dictator took away human rights. Um, the choice of a person or a government can violate people's human rights, but they can never take them away. Why? Because if a government could do that, then that would mean that whatever happens to those people is not wrong. Because the human rights are what tell you that this treatment would be inappropriate. So if you were able to take my right to life away from me, then killing me wouldn't be wrong anymore. It wouldn't be immoral. Because you're not violating my rights if the right was taken away. right? So if we say that someone took away my right to life by killing me, that's not how we should speak about this. They could violate my right to life but they can't take it away. 
no one can take away your moral rights. No one can take away human rights, if they exist. If that's really the right moral perspective to endorse, then these things are not contingent on anything. The world could be a shithole, morally speaking, and like everyone could be, I just realized that word is kind of loaded because of contemporary discourse. Thanks again, Trump. I like that word. Ah, he's ruining all my favorite words. <laughs> I guess that I shouldn't be too attached to shithole. But if, if we just imagine this world was full of injustice, just like a den of scum and villainy like from Star Wars, um, that wouldn't mean that human rights don't exist. They still exist. They're just getting trampled on 24-7. Right? So um, if human rights exist, they're not contingent on human institutions, which include things like cultural conventions, cultural traditions, governments, stuff like that. Okay, so next big question is what rights exist? And I'm going to do this a little more quickly, but it's really going to be a derivative of what we found in the first movement. Um, so the things that we were able to give, if, if Arnold's arguments succeed, the things that they're able to justify is just a general concern about um, the power, the, the value of being able to have the power to set my own ends for myself, freedom, being self-determining, and empowerment, what they call well-being, but which I prefer to call empowerment. That is, to have the external circumstances, resources, and opportunities that allow my choices to actually mean something. Okay, so it's not just something happening in my head. It's not just Epictetus in his cell as a slave who's saying, like, my mind is free, but also my life is free, okay, that I'm empowered to actually make my choices mean something. Um, that's what these two parts are. In, in terms of getting straight on what human rights we have, they're going to be in one of those two categories. So some of them have to do with this power of self-determination. So Gewirth says, right to freedom is violated if a person is subjected to violence, coercion, deception, or any other procedures that attack or remove informed control of their behavior by unforced choice. Um, includes having a sphere of personal autonomy and privacy. I would say, arguably, this kind of thing, this kind of basis is not just a matter, it's not going to necessarily mean individualistic social constructions versus collectivist social uh, um, constructions. Take, for example, um, I think I was talking about Confucianism in the last lecture. Maybe not. Maybe, I think so. I think I did. Um, I hope. I hope I did. <laughs> um, no one's in the chat to correct me. Um, in, in this kind of Confucian ideal, which is a very collectivist kind of thing, um, people have their responsibilities and obligations, but it's not as though there's this kind of, um, there, there's this kind of top-down hierarchical model for society, but it's not like a, a totalitarian dictatorship where everyone's being coerced at every turn. The goal is harmony. The ideal of, of a Confucian utopia is a harmony of people in society. Yes, they have different positions. Yes, there's this kind of caste thing going on with what level in, in the pecking order are you, but it's not like I talked, if I talked about it before, I definitely talked about it this way. It's not about power of the people at the top over the people on the bottom. It's more like the responsibilities of each person who's playing a role that they should freely choose to participate in this system um, out of respect and concern for everybody else. So if I'm lower down, I'm obeying the, the people who are above me in this kind of social hierarchy, not because I don't have a will, I'm not an individual who can make choices or determine values or something, but it's that these other people are just, they have a different job to do than me. And their job is to be looking at the bigger picture a little bit more and making these kind of more management the sorts of decisions rather than doing all the more nitty-gritty work and the management has levels too right so it's different people kind of operating on different levels um, anyone who's maybe got some experience with the military and the chain of command knows that this isn't here the chain of command does not exist to violate people's autonomy but to empower their autonomy that there are certain things you don't need to be thinking about in order to do your job. And if you try to think about them, you're not going to do your job very well. That is actually deeply Confucian. I don't know if you realize this, but military culture in the United States is deeply collectivist and, and, and I think bears a remarkable similarity 
to Confucius's uh, political philosophy. So this value about freedom doesn't mean um, individualistic like American culture or something like that. This might be a com common denominator between collectivist and individualistic cultures. Um, so, th but that's what all of, all the human rights that we're going to start talking about, more specific rights um, that are going to come from freedom, are all about ways of not interfering with people's ability to make choices in an unforced and an uncoerced way. That's going to be the real key thing here. Um, there are th these things might start feeling like empowerment things, but I think they're actually right. Uh, control over physical integrity, like being able to make decisions about what medical procedures happen to you. That really is consistent with self-determination. Um, freedom of belief, like freedom of religion, for example. Um, for expression, uh, like free speech, stuff like that. Um, and association, to decide who you're going to relate to. Um, these are sort of things that are a part of the choices we make for ourselves about what perspectives we're going to have. Nothing about granting those kinds of freedoms means saying whatever you do with that freedom is okay. And that's where I think the, the collectivist uh, context is useful to kind of connect the dots here a little bit more again. Um, collectivist cultures are not saying you shouldn't have freedom because you need to be controlled by some paternalistic power over you. It's to say you should freely choose, you should use your freedom in this way. You should be using your freedom to be plugging in and being aware of and sensitive to people around you. I mean, even in America, we are concerned about things like um, hospitality. Um, think about like um, Southern hospitality, like there's a kind of stereotype about uh, these uh, conventions of culture in the South about how you treat guests and how you're attentive to what's going on with them and you don't make everything about you and this sort of thing. I mean, just basic things that we might call basic decency is really all the collective, it, well, maybe I shouldn't say all, but a lot of what um, is the mentality behind collectivist paradigms. Um, that you, should, you shouldn't just be thinking about yourself the whole time. That's the usual collectivist criticism of individualistic cultures, is that they're selfish and narcissistic, um, and they're not recognizing their moral responsibilities to others and things like that. Um, and I'd say that could maybe be a misunderstanding of individualism, too. Individualistic cultures are not morally endorsing selfishness and narcissism. Um, they're, they, they might be focused more on what could be a common denominator here with collectivist cultures, too. That's a little bit of me trying to extend this conversation, because we can worry, like Velasquez worries, that when we start talking about specific human rights, that we might start importing our own cultural values into that and projecting them onto this grand stage of what is universal and necessary to just being a human, being a person, right? Um, that we want to be careful about. Um, so we want to stick to just what we've got the theoretical foundations for, okay? So that's one thing. Um, we could talk about uh, restrictions, exceptions to this. Uh, definitely rights are going uh, rights for freedom are going to be curtailed if using those freedoms would mean taking other people's freedom so we're we're trying to think egalitarian about this it's not like uh, some people should have the same basic right uh, different basic rights now this is where Velasquez is pretty relevant again and thinking about cultural differences it might be that we want to say um, people might be given, different levels of initiative, we might say, like if we're thinking about these hierarchical societies uh, as opposed to egalitarian societies that are trying to like put everyone on the same footing, like having everyone be like, like at various times in American history, the ideal has been a society of the middle class. You don't have super poor and super rich, but you have like one class. It's just everyone's in this kind of middle class. We're all peers and equals. Um, that we're all able to kind of achieve this sort of life. And maybe maybe there are some people who excel a little bit more, but, but definitely not uh, a tiered structure to society. Everyone gets to vote, and they get one vote. Some people's votes don't count for more than other people's votes, that kind of basic political equality of America, right? So there, there might be a concern here about a, about a contrast between these two things. But I can imagine a way in which... Um, you could say when it comes to people's moral rights, 
those are all the same across the board. No one counts for more than anybody else. But when it comes to a practical system or structure for society, it could make sense on the grounds of wanting to respect everybody's moral equality that we're going to give people different jobs. So, for instance, think about, think about this for American society. There's a little bit of hierarchy going on here in terms of social structure with politics. Politicians, uh, their voice, their opinion counts for more than mine. We all vote the same way, but once someone gets elected, they're a representative of the people, right? It's not like every time the government wants to do something, we all vote on it as like a referendum. We don't do that. What happens is the representatives, the senators, the, 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 the representatives for the House of Representatives, um, the courts, right? There, there are these people who are playing a role in our society that has more influence, that has more power, in determining what's going to happen in our society, the pre going all the way to the president of the United States, like what what the president tweets just has a bigger impact than what I could tweet on the internet. Um, his voice counts in a bigger way, right? But that could be for the benefit of everyone. Um, that's why the founding fathers went for a democratic republic, a representational form of democracy rather than pure democracy like maybe the Athenians had, um, or something closer to that, the ancient Athenians. Um, that might make sense. And you could go a little further on that. Like in a, Confucius doesn't go down for democracy. <laughs> he doesn't like democracy. So that might be something to have a debate about. But there, there's room to have that discussion. And now we've got some sort of metric to sort of think about it and say, okay, well, if we've got this general mandate that we need to have rights around freedom, you know, okay, how are we going to now make some of these more particular decisions? Which one does a better job of respecting that? Okay, um, I'm going to skip some over some of this stuff because I'm already getting long here, and I am running out of gas <laughs> energetically, so thanks for your patience with me. I hope I'm still engaging uh, and a high enough energy level. On this well-being thing, again, this is about empowerment, and this is maybe a little bit more straightforward because... Um, we can talk, uh, it's easier to maybe identify what sort of um, continuums of empowerment are necessary for people's choices to mean something. Um, I, I really like that uh, one of the reasons I brought up Arnold as one of the readings here is because he talks about these other philosophers, Amyarda Sen and Martha Nussbaum are both really, really cool contemporary uh, philosophers working on social justice. And they've got this interesting idea that they call the capabilities approach. So in terms of the moral rights that we need to respect for people and what society owes people or something like that, what they owe are opportunities. Not to ensure that people do the right thing with those opportunities, but just that the opportunities are available. In other words, you have to empower people to have a capacity to do something. That's not just their responsibility to develop. Your efforts don't mean anything if you're not given the opportunities and the ways in which your effort can be empowered to make a change in your own life. Um, I think the basic argument here is the idea of pulling yourself up from your bootstraps is a fantasy. Even the person who is like the self-made person has a lot of opportunities that allow any of their efforts to mean something. Now, did their efforts make a contribution? Oh, yeah, we're not reducing that. We're not minimizing that. Um, we're not eliminating it from the analysis here. But recognizing that, like Aristotle says, all the choices you make only result in some kind of goal. They only manifest the excellent end with this sort of cooperation from the world. Under the, under the right circumstances, all my efforts could mean nothing. Okay. So in terms of what we owe people, in terms of well-being, basic goods, um, the physical and psychological capabilities needed for human functioning. This might sound like Aristotle again. Um, it's just a matter of giving people the opportunities to make those things happen, not to ensure that their lives actually have those excellences, but that there's nothing environmentally in the way of them doing this. So they put it this way. People can mess up what they're given to work with. That's their fault and not the failure of others to respect them properly. So you kind of own your own mistakes, right? Um, thus, we have obligations to, uh, if we have obligations to others, is to make these capacities available, not to ensure that these potentials are lived up to or exploited, 
So take something like um, education. Um, if we were going to take, uh, if we're going to say people have a right to education, which is on the UN De Declaration of Human Rights, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, um, then a government or a business entity or any social institution could say, uh, well, okay, what do we need to do then? Well, we need to make sure that people have access to education. That doesn't mean we force them to go to schools, like mandatory, like uh, you're going to go to jail if you don't send your kids to school or something like that. Um, but it's an option. It's out there. So we've got public schools that you don't have to pay for, that if you want to send your kids to school, there's nothing that's going to get in the way of that. Or if you're going to pay for it, but uh, if, we, if it's something we need to pay for, and you don't happen to have the money, we're not going to have your poverty be something that gets in the way of it. We'll subsidize it with scholarships or things like that. Or even this is the idea behind public libraries. Public libraries are funded by the government for the sake of public education, that citizens can educate themselves. Now, do you go to the library? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But it's there. It's available to you. No one is depriving you of that opportunity. You have the capability in terms of external circumstances to make education a part of your life. That's your choice. Um, in many ways, this is how I operate as a teacher in college. I try to provide a lot of support to my students. I like try to put myself out there and be accessible, but I don't force you to talk to me. Um, and if you don't take up that opportunity, it's your choice. I'm not going to uh, force you to do anything. I'm going to present the class and be like, here's what it's going to take in order to pass this class. But it's your, de it's your free decision to decide whether you want to participate in that or not. Right? So your freedom is being respected and empowered by being given this opportunity. Okay. Um, so, uh, bah, 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 bah. yeah, functional capabilities, a lot like Aristotle. Um, so part of, part of the guidance here about how we're going to work out the details here of well-being, we're going to come down to um, what are the things that people need to have as goods in order to be able to function and have these basic human functions of life. Um, the things that you'd want to maybe use your freedom to choose. Again, cultural stuff can come in here. Um, and according to the theory that Arnold's throwing down in terms of these rights, um, it's okay if a culture emphasizes some of these things more than others, or if a group of people in a community decide to use their freedom in a certain patterned way. There's no problem with that. It only might be a problem if a society starts repressing anything else. Uh, or eliminating the opportunities for anything else. That could be a problem, right? Okay. Um, and then and then that might be where there's going to be some uh, disagreement between cultures, like ones that are more tolerant, ones that are more repressive. Um, and Arnold's going to say, yeah, on grounds of human rights, those repressive ones have got to change. They're not doing it right. Okay. Um, yeah. A lot to do here, I say here in my lecture notes, still a lot to cash out, and that's true, but maybe Arnold here has given us a push. He's built a foundation that we could be like, you know what, we can have this conversation. We can get people from different cultures together, maybe we can connect about this stuff about freedom and empowerment, um, that we recognize that this is a shared value, and actually there's no other option really. <laughs> uh, if you care about anything, then you're logically committing yourself to caring about freedom and empowerment. So now let's work out the things about like what choices should we make in terms of particular rights, particular opportunities to be empowering people with. Okay, but that, there's, there's another uh, source of po possible objection like I was mentioning in my kind of overview part of this lecture with Arnold and that's, okay, what a great wonderful castle in the sky that you've made and that the UN has made, but how is this supposed to be actually applied? practically. There's a lot of practical problems here. Managers can't do it. They don't know what they're doing about this, Milton Friedman says. Um, so why should we think about human rights as something that could actually be informing policies for multinational corporations and the managers that run them? And that's where Arnold has some more things to say. Uh, whew. Yeah, I'm getting tired. Okay, let's try to finish this off. Okay, um, I did say, uh, you know, I have a note here in my lecture notes here, let's think through this as we go along. Not a lot of critical attention is given here, what can we see? Um, 
I think there's more explicit arguing happening in the other two sections. I, I think this is more of Arnold just being like, here's my point of view about it. But we would probably want to think about this more critically. But here's what he's going to say. In order to apply human rights uh, to actual business policies, you need innovative moral decision making. Um, this is and and Arnold's position here is that what that requires in terms of a skill set is nothing new. It's the it's just the standard skill set of a good manager just applied to a different project to a different end, the respect of human rights and the operation of a business instead of pure profit maximizing. Okay, that's what he's going to try to argue for. Um, so what are those skills that we would want? If, if all we cared about was profit in running the company to make a profit, what would we, what kind of, what would we want to see in a resume in an interview of someone who is going to apply to be the CEO of the corporation? What skill set would we expect and want out of them? Um, and then how is that going to enable and empower them to be able to do this whole thing with human rights? Okay, so this is how he breaks it down um, with this idea of moral imagination. Uh, awareness of the particular capacity for productive imagination, and capacity for creativity. Um, there's all this talk about scripts throughout this section. Think about scripts as in the way that Warhain is talking about models. Very, very, very similar here. A script might be a little bit more of an applied um, version of a model. Like a model could be maybe a little bit more theoretical, but a script would be like taking that theory and then making a code of conduct out of it or something like that, like a particular policy. Um, a script is kind of like um, a uh, like an example that you're trying to emulate or apply uh, into particular cases that come down the road. So, like uh, let let's say uh, like I mentioned about the paper project you're working on, that I'm not going to give you an example of a student's paper from the past. But I said, use the papers that we've had in the class as models. Um, a script would be kind of like the breakdown I gave you in that lecture about, look at what's been happening in a lot of these papers that we've been reading. Um, they start out framing a problem. There's a controversy. They do some setup to give you some background information about it. They make arguments. They entertain objections. They give replies. So that's like a script, like a, a broad sort of like, uh, model or framework that then if you're working on one topic and another student's working on a different topic you can still follow the same basic script for how to write that paper uh, or the, the the document I actually I should have thought of this the document that I wrote on how to write philosophy papers that I sent out to all of you that's like a script I'm giving you like some step-by-step -step guidelines for how to attack this thing um, that would be a script too so it sets expectations it gives direction for behavior it also helps you organize uh, what's coming in to like go into a new situation and be like, okay, what's going on here? Let me get the lay of the land. The scripts that you have in the back of your mind shape your expectations of what to be tracking and watching for, what's salient to you. So that's a lot of what Rehain was talking about with um, models. So let's, let's go through these more particular skill sets, though. Awareness of the particular. You have to be kind of detail-oriented. You have to recognize how scripts fit in very particular ways in grounded circumstances and places where there can be conflicts or dilemmas in that situation. Um, very particular ones, either in the situation just on its own has a problem to it or that a certain script when applied to that situation generates a problem, that it doesn't fit right. Um, like the stuff that Warhain was warning us about in her paper, that when you take the script of um, private property, free market uh, uh, capitalism, and just throw it into this situation, things might backfire because of particular things going on there that don't fit with that script. So we have to adapt the script, right? But that adaption, you won't even get to that step. That's kind of more down here about uh, capacity for productive imagination and capacity for creativity. Um, you won't even get to those steps without first being aware and sensitive to those differences. Now, how does that fit fit in if you care about profit? Well, if you're if you're if it was just a pure profit thing, you'd want a manager to be sensitive to circumstances in the market, right? That they're not just like, ah, let's just do this. I think this worked before. Let's just do it again. 
that you'd want them to be nuanced in their choices, that they're informed, right? They recognize market conditions and how they might change and how they could affect something. That, uh, that general ability, that general skill set is what's needed to be able to apply human rights in a meaningful way, right? To figure out how these loose abstract values fit into a particular circumstance or a, a possible company policy or something like that um, in a particular cultural context, that's going to require this kind of detail-oriented managing. And then a capacity for productive imagination means uh, awareness about how scripts can be limited or distorted or incomplete and to have the willingness to even think outside the box on that sort of stuff. To take a script that's maybe worked in the past and be looking at it critically, reflecting on it critically to see if it still works. Um, you would want that kind of imaginative ability to anticipate possible problems um, and where there's other ways that things could happen um, for the direction of a business for profit just as much for human rights. Um, you want, like we sometimes, this is like a buzzword uh, in the business world today, like you want to be nimble. You want to be able to adapt, right? And that's also involved here with the capacity for creativity. Uh, to be able to think outside the box, right? To envision and actualize novel, morally justified possibilities through a fresh point of view or conceptual scheme. The ability to understand, evaluate, and rewrite. This is, I think the understand and evaluate is more here. The rewriting is more here. So once you can recognize there's other options here, then about creative application of them, to the particular circumstances that you're facing is, is required too. So um, it might, uh, I, I know most of you are uh, going into accounting, not necessarily higher management or something, leadership, like leadership positions like that. Um, but there might be a, Arnold might have a point here. I, I personally, I'm not, I'm not quite sure who I believe more, the Friedman line or the Arnold line. I think I can see some concerns both ways about it. Certainly, um, it, with the existing corporate culture that we have, people who are applying for CEO positions are not very morally sensitive. Um, they oftentimes have taken a business ethics class, not from a moral philosopher, but from a business department that's just talking about the law, that they're not sensitive to all the kinds of dilemmas that can emerge. They may not be very culturally sensitive. So they might be lacking in some of that information that would be sort of the raw material that then they could use these skill sets on. But that they're completely out of their depth, I'm not so sure. Um, a lot of the characteristics of leadership that you'd want out of a CEO, even just in a pure capitalist profit maximizing sort of way, are exactly those character attributes that if, uh, Arnold's saying, if they're just directed to a different end, they could be equally effective there too. So he, I think, one way Arnold is trying to put his point here is the fact that they're specialists in business doesn't mean they should be let off the hook of being concerned about these ethical responsibilities. They can't be like, oh, no, that's, that's not my profession. I'm not an ethicist. It's like that's a rationalization and an excuse to be insensitive. He's like, they've got everything they need. They, or maybe not everything, but they got a lot of what you need. A lot of the skill set is there. Um, they just maybe need to be tracking these issues and sensitive to them. That's the big thing, right? Whether they are directing their detailed orientedness to moral details or cultural details, whether they're looking to do a moral critical evaluation rather than just a cost benefit analysis of the bottom line. And do they, are they able to think outside the box in new forms of life and the ethical possibilities that that opens up to. Okay. So that's, this might start sounding a little hippy dippy, but um, Arnold is really trying to make the case that this is super practical. That's, that's, uh, that's something that he's going after here with the arguments he's offering at the end. Um, and he, he kind of shares with uh, Warhain this idea that multinational corporations are uh, just really in a, in the, in the spot of power in the international world. Uh, like Warhain said that they're more stable than a lot of the countries they operate in. Um, they have more stability institutionally. Um, 
And I think Arnold kind of agrees with that. Um, and they've got a lot of opportunity for making moral change happen in the world. And they don't necessarily need to be getting involved in politics or doing more aggressive social engineering like you might see in like a dystopian kind of Blade Runner uh, future where it's like corporations ruling everything or something like that and controlling people's lives, but instead relinquishing control to respect people's freedom and self-determining um, and sort of leading the pack on that, being the vanguard um, of that kind of moral progress. Um, they, they can really change uh, the momentum. And there are a lot of people in the business world today that I think are really uh, thinking along Arnold's lines. There are uh, some conventions that are set up that uh, people, business people go to, entrepreneurs go to about how to have an ethical business, like how to be financially viable, um, but not have your business run only on maximizing profits for stockholders. Um, can can you make a can you have a market presence? Can you have a niche that isn't dependent on that? And they and finding creative ways to do that, and figuring out how to increase your abilities of having the moral sensitivities and developing these skill sets that Arnold is talking about. So he really wants it to be practical. This isn't just a utopian dream, and it doesn't depend for him on a political revolution. That's the other really interesting thing. Arnold's like, you just do it, you just do it, make it happen. Interesting. Now, if we're thinking back about Friedman, there are other pauses for concern here. Uh, remember, uh, Friedman said not only that managers are not good at social engineering, that they're not informed stuff, maybe Arnold can beat back that, but there's also the question about political legitimacy. Um, Friedman was pretty adamant that this should be done through the mechanisms of democracy. And what should the corporation do? I mean, in some ways, if... if so this is a little commentary from Tim. I, I, I think it's good to kind of take these different views from all over the court and, and smash them against each other and make a debate happen. Um, Friedman might have a point here. He's got a threat to Arnold's position. I might say this. Friedman, if you're right, then multinational corporations shouldn't exist at all. Because just their existence supersedes the authority of the governments in the countries that they operate in. Um, they're already an independent kind of entity this way because they operate in different places, but they're still an organized social institution. Um, so in some ways, I think plugging Friedman's line means they, they would have to be, just their existence is unjust. That's one point. Second point, even if uh, a company says, we're not gonna exert this political function of social engineering, they are going to be social engineers regardless. That's, that's a Tim Lineman argument. I don't think there's any way for them to avoid it. Um, no matter what they choose to do, they're going to have a big influence in the societies that they're a part of. So the only question is, well, what's better? Having them just operate in a maximizing profit sort of way that's going to definitely mess up some things ethically and morally uh, in the places that they're in, or do we want them to try to have some degree of moral sensitivity to this and be tracking this stuff and include it as a part of maybe a triple bottom line or something like that? And to make sure that their operations are not this kind of uh, unilateral, um, dictatorial type of moral ideal. But if Arnold's arguments are right about human rights here, the ideal that we're trying to set up is one that creates more space for people's empowerment rather than their enslavement or coercion under these big social institutions. Um, that the whole point here is to uh, give people the ability to promote their ability to be self-determining and to empower that in a realistic way rather than just saying you've got your voice or something. Um, that they actually have the means to make decisions about this. Um, that's really interesting. I personally, when I think, when I, this is one of the reasons I like throwing Arnold in here, I think it's very thought-provoking um, and you can start doing the dreaming and, and using your immoral imagination about this stuff. I mean, imagine a company that instead of trying to coerce sales through like advertising, which is really a lot of brainwashing and psychological manipulation. I mean, it's definitely coercive warfare in my opinion. I don't think that's much of a stretch to say that. Um, the only kind of advertising that I would be justified, I think is justified is for a company to say, 
we have this product for sale here's its description like an Amazon description or something like that and that's it it's just posted you can search for it if you want to um, instead of what we see on like television ads or something like that um, if imagine a company was like yeah we don't want to do those things because that undercuts people's ability to be self-determining we're encouraging we're treating them as a means instead of as an end we're encouraging them to act on their inclinations instead of on their reasoned judgment about what they think is good etc etc imagine a company that was interested in interacting with its customers and anyone any of the stakeholders like employees and stuff like that with the aim of empowering them that'd be really different it'd be a real real different world we'd be living in um, and I don't think it would mean an economic collapse or something like that um, it might actually be the sort of risky business um, that might actually sell but maybe everyone's too afraid to give up on the old tried and true method of coercion and power instead of giving people empowerment it's interesting okay um, and oh boy I that those thoughts definitely there's a long way you can run with them back to the individualism and collectivism debate too um, that debate is fascinating to engage in with people I highly encourage you whenever you can uh, if you come from one culture or the other try to have like really explicitly critical conversations with someone that comes from the other culture it can be a real fascinating time um, some and really fun like inspiring like it gets me fired up when I do that. I'm like yeah let's think about what new things could we create here what would it look like and the points of connection and disagreement very interesting and not just for diversity is fun for diversity's sake but being like how could all of our lives be more meaningful and more um, ideal by rethinking the scripts that we're running with um, to have a critical attitude about our ethical perspectives okay so that's enough of my my little talking here um, I hope this all makes sense I think Arnold is a is a little bit more of a difficult paper to read um, let me know if there's more things that you're not sure about um, and these big picture questions we've been kind of doing with international business we're gonna keep that train rolling with social and economic justice next week with Rawls Cohen and Nozick um, that's gonna be some challenging stuff give yourself plenty of time to do the reading um, and uh, maybe get prepared to be shooken up a little bit um, I think no matter what perspective you come from there's gonna be some provoking stuff in this unit um, uh, Cohen will definitely do that a little bit he's a very polarizing guy um, but I'm, lo I'm looking forward to going through it and helping you uh, and supporting you through trying to make sense of these things but more than any other unit in the quarter so far this has been a standing thing I've said before but definitely I would say expectations going into this next unit it's gonna be tough it's probably not gonna make a lot of sense on your first reading if you get a chance to read it a second time do it it'll be better but also even then might be a lot of stuff that won't make sense I'll try to do my damnedest to, to in my lectures to clear it up and make it accessible um, but don't don't beat yourself up if it's not making sense right off the page in your efforts with it um, I would say at a certain point just keep going with the reading and just get familiar with what are the sorts of things that are being talked about in the language and then we'll sort it all out in the lectures next week okay uh, have a great weekend everyone stay tuned for my weekend update stay in contact with me about those papers there are still some people out there who have not talked to me about a paper topic and the clock is really ticking down here um, you've got a week left as of tomorrow so um, I was advising trying to get an outline done by the end of this week and then having a week to compose the draft and edit it um, but uh, yeah definitely um, definitely if you haven't talked to me you want to do it like ASAP um, nothing's too late I don't want you to be scared away from shame or anything like that like I should have talked to you weeks ago Tim and I didn't talk to me now let's make the best of it um, as much as we can but uh, definitely um, I want this to be not a painful thing for you and doing it last minute is going to be painful I really hope that doesn't happen I want to do everything I can to support you in it so let me know okay oh code word I almost forgot code word I didn't forget thank goodness um, mm, uh, green tea that's what's keeping me alive right now <laughs> all right uh, that's the code word for tonight green tea until next time